We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the dooms to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. So the first thing I'm going to do is show you just a piece of uh, uh, something that is largely stop-motion animation with puppets. Um, and this should stretch your notion of what puppetry is. It also it features a, a live actor, and it has a bit of live-action puppetry, although this particular one not a whole lot. Uh, but it's done by the, uh, the great uh, Czech filmmaker Jan Schwenkmeyer. Oh, come in, please. No, 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 I, I've just about started, so I'm explaining. We're about to watch a version of Alice in Wonderland, but this is, the, the whole movie's nine, uh, about 80 minutes long, and this is just about five, five six minutes of it. And, uh, but this should stretch your notion, get you thinking about what puppetry is. No, some of it was live. It, that is, he he will mix things up, and he added so quickly. Sometimes it's hard to tell. But I first became interested in puppetry through films like Schwenkmeyer's Alice and some of his other films, and I was very interested in the fact that there was so much texture in the film. And mm -hmm. texture is something that interests me a lot uh, because I think our world is made of kind of flat textures. When I saw these uh, this, these kinds of films, I said to myself, um, hmm. well, I was first just attracted to them and still remain attracted to them simply as films. But eventually, on doing some uh, <coughs> research, it occurred to me that it wasn't just films. That it was, if I went to the Czech Republic, I would see things that might look like this. And the fascinating thing is, you know, uh, he moves the little doll around, but he also is moving bones around. And so that radically challenged my notion of what a puppet was, because like most Americans, uh, it was Muppets, it was uh, little marionettes and such, and I, I, I'm trying to remember when the first time I saw a real puppet show was, uh, any kind, even, even Bad Muppets or something. And it wasn't until 1987, and I was born in 1955, so that's quite a while, when I was actually in Paris on the steps of uh, Sacre Coeur, and as I was there, there was a strange guy doing this thing. It's like he had a large purple velvet uh, uh, blanket or something, a, you know, a curtain over the ground. And I didn't see him at first. What I saw is a character come out, just a head, and then another character. They were all connected to this one uh, piece of like uh, purple velvet. And it was fascinating. He was telling the story, and then another another character would come out. Uh, that's what I get for being demonstrative. Uh, but only later, after I started studying puppetry, that what I had seen was a puppet show. So that was actually a very good introduction. But um, and of course, I'd seen things on television that didn't particularly interest me. Puppets did not... I did not grow up watching puppets on television or anything. I never even watched Sesame Street because I was a little too old for that. Although I do remember seeing early Muppets before they became kind of commercialized on the Ed Sullivan show and such, and I thought they were pretty funny as a kid. Anyway, um, 
when I did, uh, just to make, wrap this up short, because this is repeating, I, I did give Richard a couple of copies of the uh, the DVD that of the last lecture I did about basically how I discovered puppetry was an art form. And so I don't want to repeat all that. But just for the sake of, of uh, this, what I did come to the conclusion of when I started traveling through Europe, particularly on my 2005 trip, uh, was I realized that this was an art form that actually spoke very well to the 21st century because we're living in a world of screens. Everyone's got screens attached to them. But even these puppet films were super tangible. And it was the tangibility, it was the tactility. Uh, one of Schrankmeyer's big uh, thoughts is tactility. And he, would, uh, he was also an artist and he would invent these boxes that you would stick your hands into and you had no idea what was inside them. <laughs> and there would be all these strange textures ranging from, I mean, you have to be very careful, <laughs> ranging from like gelatinous substances to glass. And he would really make you wonder, but he, his feeling is, why can't we make art out of actual touch? You know, disconnected from the other senses. Mm -hmm. So that was a very interesting concept. But eventually, uh, I, I took this back to Alaska, where I... I proved uh, these things are still successful today in my hometown, particularly around fair time. We have a, there's a troop that cut off from what I was doing, and they continue to do it. Also, I took another troop of my own around America for two months and played in places ranging from like an anarchist art collective in Oakland to a fundamentalist high school in Florida. <laughs> and I found everywhere in between people accepting this. At, at first, I would talk to people saying, yeah, is there a good place for a puppet show to play in your town? And they would say, well, is it for children? And I would go, no. As soon as I said no, they had no more pictures left in their mind. So if you were to do that with music, they'd immediately know what kind of music you play and say, oh, well, those musicians play there. But because no one had any idea, this was like such a bizarrely different art form. Anyway, so what, what I'm doing here is I, I eventually started uh, researching the history of the art and uh, picked up lots of books. I have probably over 70 DVDs uh, of just puppet imagery, plus lots of books and, that I've read. I got myself to the point where I could actually talk to the puppet historian who just died on January 3rd this year, Henrik Yurkowski. And uh, he's the man who wrote the, the big book on European puppet history. Uh, it's about two volumes, about, you know, that thick. Um, now, one of the main theories about where puppetry originates is in India. Uh, and I just talked to one man in uh, Belgium who swore up and down it was India. But I asked this uh, Yurkovsky this, and he said, no, it had to be, uh, the certain amount did come out of India, but it had to be independent because of the nature of puppetry. It, it, it's like anyone can pick up a stick and start to move it. <coughs> now, there are two aspects of the orig origins of puppetry. One is it's probably connected to dolls. Just as any child can make a stick that looks like a human start to act like a, mm -hmm. uh, a doll. The, different, the main difference between dolls and puppets is that dolls are essentially played with the self or a couple of people, you know, but they, they play them for themselves. Turn it around, say, I'm doing this for you now, and it's puppetry. So naturally, certain devices were invented to make, facilitate that. Whereas you don't need arms that move and such with, with puppetry. Um, and we'll, we'll, as we go through, I'll mention the different kinds of puppetry. This is an old Indian puppet. Oh, the other, the other area of puppetry, like many arts, they started in religion. That is to say that people, uh, particularly shamans and such, would, would, the shaman would have... Uh, you know, some sort of little show that he would give to people. And sometimes, you know, there's a whole culture of masks that go with this, mm -hmm. but also little figures. Now, sometimes these things would devolve into idols. Other times they would move on uh, into, well, eventually these things would become puppetry and were done much more for entertainment. If you go to someplace like Java today, you'll see uh, shadow puppets done. The, it's called the Wayang uh, way and cool it, and we'll see some images of that. But they're done, it's kind of a halfway house between religion, they tell the old Hindu stories of the Ramayana, and on the other side 
it's just entertainment. And in fact, these are these puppet shows go on so long, like eight hours, that they ha actually had a television station. I don't know if it's still operating, but did nothing but these, which would be fascinating to at least you know turn it on. It's like and just watch it for a while. But obviously, I wouldn't be getting it. So this is an early puppet unearthed somewhere in India. One of the reasons why India is often given the uh, uh, the role of being the place for the origin of puppets is because actors were prohibited from playing the gods. So now this, these are also uh, these are probably uh, maybe 150, 200 years old, which is pretty old as far as puppets go. And one of the reasons that it's very hard to find old puppets is because they're just used and then kind of break and they fall apart and they're thrown away, at least traditionally. Uh, these are more more recent Indian puppets, and as you can see, they have they have all kinds there. So they have string puppets, they have uh, shadow puppets, they have hand puppets. Another reason why people often say that India kind of invented everything, although there's a lot of good reason to suppose that the Chinese actually invented shadow puppets. These are two dimensional puppets, and they can be used as shadow puppets. Or in what we could call, uh, there's another word being used now, toy theater. Toy theater is like uh, uh, like you might have a little two-dimensional thing. And it's like moving little paper dolls around inside of it. So it's a, it's a whole fascinating area. There was a big toy doll festival in New York City about ten years ago that I wish I had attended. Um, these now are shadow puppets. Hold on one second here. Yeah, so these are Javanese shadow puppets, and uh, I actually I think these are Thai. These are not Javanese. So um, hold on a second. No, these are Chinese. Sorry, there's Chinese are some of the most complex. There are often pieces of leather that are, have millions of little holes punched into them. That, but they can also add uh, elements to give them color. And sometimes this is these are transparent. Um, this is what the uh, the Wayan Kulit looks like, the Javanese puppets uh, from Indonesia. Um, and that lighting behind there is typical because there's never you would never use this with like an electric lamp behind it. It has to be like an oil burning lamp, something with that gives it this kind of uh, moving glow. Um, and so, like I say, to the to the person not understanding this, you could probably sit there for an hour, maybe two. But you don't know the story. But they can make whole battles take place. And, I mean, they tell these elaborate, long stories with this. And, and the imagery is just fantastic. Also in Indonesia, uh, we have what's called the Wayang Golet, which is the, uh, the, the sorry, Wayang Golek, which is the uh, three-dimensional puppet. And these eventually will influence the European scene. But those are pretty amazing, and just in detail. Uh, Japan has several forms of puppetry. The one which is the most amazing, which I, I probably needed a better picture. This is actually a, a photo I took uh, on my trip. Uh, there is a puppet theater in Brussels, which has an amazing little museum attached to it. Many of these images of puppets from India come from that museum that I took on my trip. But uh, the Japanese have a style called bunraku. Did you ever run into that? Yeah. It's, it's uh, usually there are three people connected to one puppet and one person just moves the head, another person moves like the torso and a foot and another person moves like, I think one person moves the head in the right hand, the other person moves like maybe uh, the torso and the left hand and the other person moves the feet. But these things are so disciplined that to get from the entry level of doing the bottom part of the body to the head takes about 25 years. That's how complex these puppets are to move. And and the whole point is that you will see there's three figures on stage. Two are covered in complete black, look like ninjas, you know, but you can't see their face at all. One, though, the master, will be standing there with the puppet. And he will be breathing with the puppet and making the puppet do these extraordinarily subtle things. But you see his face the whole time, absolutely impassive. You, you can't see anything inside of him. He puts it all into the puppet. So he sits there, blank, stone-faced. 
and does this with the puppet. I do have one. I've never seen it live, but I do have one Japanese movie that is nothing but a long Bunraku story. Uh, of course, puppets do come from other places. These are African puppets, uh, probably probably about 100 years old. These are fairly old. These are from a museum. And Africans also have a lot of things to, to this day that are somewhere between masks and puppets. Um, and a lot of these still have a lot of very strong religious connotations. This is actually a puppet from my area of the world in Alaska. This is a clinket puppet. I've actually never seen one. This is from the museum, the Natural History Museum in New York. And uh, that is a, if you notice in the middle there, there's actually a face. And, and uh, this is a, called a transformation puppet, made out of bones and sinew. Okay, so that's, essentially, I don't want to spend too much time on all, I mean, there's so much puppetry around the world. I'm going to hone in more on the history of puppetry in Europe, which is a very different, uh, will bring us up to the things we do both in Europe today and in America, and much of the world is influenced by this. But there is a whole lot more history of puppetry around the world, and uh, it's a pretty extensive thing. So let us look at some... Uh, deal with some history. So the first thing we're going to do is go back to ancient Egypt. Now, I have another photo that looks like this of the actual uh, puppet that this is based on. This is obviously a reconstruction of something found in a uh, pyramid. And so you can see, you pull a string on the back and it, make, it looks like it's grinding uh, flour. And... Uh, Again, the line between doll and puppet was probably pretty loose here. But this could have had religious significance as well, you know. But uh, nevertheless, this would be a primitive Egyptian puppet, one of the oldest puppets we know of. Um, the, uh, the other photo, unfortunately, was just so bad that you can't really see it as clearly. This is also an Egyptian pub a puppet from a later period. And uh, I assume the feet move, the arms look like they move. And again, the line between doll and puppet here is probably pretty thin. These are ancient Greek puppets. And again, uh, people debate whether they're uh, dolls or puppets. Uh, it's hard to know from this period. We don't have a lot of source material or writing about it. But we do know, as time went on, they developed more and more puppetry. So... Um, Now, these figures are probably figures of the gods and such. This is Roman. It, well, the interesting thing that happened in Roman, there's a real development in puppetry. Um, but the problem is, it's the same reason, you know, like, you know, why didn't Christians do puppetry during the Roman times? It wasn't because it was all religious. Romans in their theater and in their puppets had turned very seriously to farce. And the farce was... Uh, kind of beyond anything that we even consider crude. I mean, it's just just scatological, over-the-edge, pornographic, uh, scabrous stuff. So the Christians did not want anything to do with the theatrical world or the Roman age. A lot of their, their, their theater events, uh, they weren't as refined as the Greeks. They were, you know, and, and in fact, some people say that the, the theatricals out on the street ruled the empire, that is to say, because they were always commenting on what was happening, in a sense, behind the doors of the uh, the emperors and the, the higher-ups. So it was a very strange scene. But, nevertheless, the, the artistry here, you can really see now that these are puppets. You know, there's a lot of movement in, you know, a lot of, uh, of parts that move and such. And this is a figure called uh, Mascus. Maccus, sorry. And uh, this is, I don't have any actual uh, image of him, but this is a, a kind of an artist depiction of what he looked like based on, uh, obviously, uh, some sort of statue or something. But this character was an, one of the Roman characters that was completely <coughs> made uh, really foul gestures and commented on everything. Uh, later in Europe, uh, you would find characters developing like Punch, or uh, 
most recently, uh, Don Cristobal, who's also a punch relative, uh, two puppeteers were arrested about a week or so ago, a week and a half ago, uh, for saying things that were interpreted as terrorism in Spain. So uh, someone, I, I've been seeing that, that story for a couple of weeks now. But, um, but some people think they come from this Roman figure. But there's no evidence to support that. And the reason there's no evidence is because of all that dark time after the Roman Empire, when we don't know much of what happened. So there is a period after uh, the fall of the Roman Empire when we know nothing about what the puppeteers were doing. What starts to happen, though, is that now these would be more advanced puppets. That is, these are not medieval puppets. These are probably two, three hundred years old. But nevertheless, these are the three wise men. Puppets began to be used by Christians as to present uh, biblical stories, particularly the nativity, which there are still puppet nativity versions. Uh, here's one more modernistic one done in the middle of the 20th century by a, uh, an Austrian, uh, Richard Teschner. Richard Teschner. And, um, but... Uh, but th there were so, uh, there were also death and resurrection puppet shows and various you know Noah's Ark and such like this and you could see where you know especially for something like Noah's Ark it'd be really helpful to have like puppets because you've got all these animals you get a big boat you move it around these were actually done in church what started happening though was certain characters started for instance uh, they would do these morality plays and you would have a character like Vice. Vice started to take on comic dimensions. So now you've got a situation in the late Middle Ages where people are in church watching puppet shows <coughs> laughing at crude characters. Well, that wasn't going to last. So they eventually got them out in the church and said, okay, you're fine, but you have to do this on the streets now. And so they became street performers. Um, uh, and essentially this leads to what we would call theater, you know, both the puppets and the actors. This is an il interesting illustration of perhaps how puppetry was done. Uh, this is not the Middle Ages, but, but it gives you a good point. There's a, 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 a traveling uh, showman who comes along, and he's got a few figures, and he's doing a story, uh, it looks like on a table here, and people are sitting around watching. Uh, the puppeteer's life was a fairly humble life when it was disconnected from the church, and it was just a traveling uh, show. This is one of the earliest images we have um, from the Middle Ages. It's just a simple, uh, I can't remember which book this was from, but it's a simple illustration. But you'll notice, this is the Middle Ages, and you have two little characters in here fighting. These will become the most important characters in puppetry in Europe. And that is, eventually they will become maybe... Punch and Judy, or Don Cristobal, or Kasparov, uh, or Kasparak, or and there's basically almost one in every country. Is there a Danish one? There is, isn't there? Somebody who's kind of a weird little puppet. Oh yeah, every, every yeah. summer in a particular park. Yeah. There's puppet shows. Right. Um, so, one big source for the puppet world, and this is connected to that last picture as well, is the Commedia dell'arte. The, the, the figures, we call them stock figures, meaning that you have, when a person plays a, a, a figure, you're always playing this one character. You're not supposed to... You, you can improvise within the character, but the point is, this is Punchinella, and Punchinella was this rascally figure. And whenever you do a Punchinella, you do a rascally figure. Uh, there's also Harlequin, Arlequino, which is Harlequin. Uh, there's the clown. And there's several other characters, some related to the jester. So these characters that developed in Italy eventually started traveling. And the best way to make them travel was actually to do a puppet show. That way, one person could take, this is a punchinella, uh, and you could go with your punchinella, character and maybe a couple other figures and do something in that little little bitty stage you saw and uh, in China they have a stage like that too and actually the guy is tied 
on the bottom, the curtain is tied. To, you can see his feet. But inside, he's got his hands up above. So this technique evidently spread quite far. Uh, these are more, this is from my recent trip, these are uh, Comédie de l'Arte puppets that I saw in Brussels just kind of hanging up in this museum. And here you have, this looks like uh, the French variation on here, which would be called uh, Polichanel. And so this would be a typical thing. People would come here and, now look at this, this looks like a mouse, a rat that's been hit. And this looks like a cat. So you have a rat and a cat as part of the show. The English took it one step further and put a dog literally sitting on the edge of the stage. His name is always Toby. And we'll see a picture of him. And the whole point of the dog is all hell is breaking loose with these guys. They're bashing each other to pieces. But the dog just sits there which is really funny. Um, the most trouble I ever got into doing puppets was when I did a Punch and, punch and Judy show at the, our local state fair as part of our uh, bigger puppet production. I, well, I, killed, I did what I was supposed to do. I killed the wife. I killed the baby. <laughs> Eventually death shows up. Death gets, gets killed. It's just, he's, a, he's psychotic. I mean, as a character goes, it's very interesting. And they say that the this is uh, more of uh, Punch. Punch always has this, like, big nose and a uh, humpback. And uh, this is a good picture from probably the uh, over 100 years ago of uh, the to a Toby with a Punch. So Punch is this character. It's interesting that this character, he, this is the most vicious version the English have the most vicious version. People have theorized why the English version is the most vicious. And it could be because the English always kind of had to keep a lid on things that, say, down in Italy, people were like, well, oh, you know, but in England it was more like, no, nah, we've got to keep things in proper order. And so he's the opposite of everything English. He is just the English nightmare. And literally, he, he uh, in some versions, he goes down and, and he kills the devil. And he kills the hangman. And, you know, he, he can't be killed. He can't be stopped. He's just like the ultimate psychotic figure. There's actually, uh, in black American blues, there's a figure called Stagger Lee, who's very similar. But it's, it's unique to have a character as that unredemptive. <laughs> You know, it's you just have to have Toby in there to balance the oh, exactly, guy. exactly. <laughs> but Punch became a real figure. There was a magazine that went on for years called Punch, and was a real figure in English society, and uh, a figure that, in a sense, was you know uh, the the focus of satire. You could use Punch to do all sorts of things. This is uh, the French version, Polichinel. In uh, this is actually in the museum in. Uh, Lyon, the Gadania Museum, which I highly recommend going to. This is also from the same. I, I took these photos. Um, Jeepers. I believe that's his wife. And the interesting thing is Punch used to have teeth, too, back in, in the day. And the teeth really ratchet this thing up to another level. You know, And they say as the... the the pressure has come to make these things for children. There are two kinds of people who, they're called punch professors in England. Two kinds of people who do them. One who does them for the kids, and the other one tries to do the original one. But you get in trouble if you do the original one too close to the originals, because they are quite intense. Um, let's see who's next here. So in France, there was another development about 210 years ago. And um, there was a guy named Morgay. This is not him, but uh, this is, uh, uh, you have, uh, he created a character that was a very much a, a Lyonnaise character named Guignol, who was a, what's called the canoe, which is a, a, a silk uh, uh, worker. And, uh, and the, he has this friend called Nafron. And Nafron always kind of oh, 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 talks kind of like that, so that's why Nafron. But these are rascals. They're not nearly as psychotic as, uh, you know, uh, Punch and Judy and all the rest of uh, the Commedia dell'arte uh, Punchinella. But they are quite rascally. And uh, I've really been interested in this character. This is a picture of a uh, painting of Morgay with uh, Guignol that's also in that museum. And this is one of the oldest Guignols. Uh, 
As you can see, he's kind of got a smile on his face. I, I liken him more in America. The only way we have to understand this is he's more like Bugs Bunny. <laughs> which is to say he's always a rascal, but you kind of like him always. Yes. <laughs> and this is actually a, uh, a puppet. The guy behind him is supposed to be more gay. And so this is a little puppet. These are hand puppets. So it's a little puppet on the end of the bigger puppet, which is a fascinating concept. But uh, these stories are often, uh, this is more of, uh, you don't just have Guignol, you have a whole phalanx of characters, and whenever you go into these places, they will do Sleeping Beauty, or they will do, uh, uh, even Alice in Wonderland, they will do Faust, they will do Romeo and Juliet, and then have Guignol somewhere inside there. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so that, that if, the, you know, if you're going to have uh, Guignol inside of Romeo and Juliet, well, first of all, it would have to be a comic version of Romeo and Juliet. And secondly, it would have to be a... Uh, um, you'd have Guignol as, like, uh, the monk or something, you know. The, the, so you'd have him as a kind of a side character. Um, and now this is uh, from a Czech automated music machine. But essentially, this is the Kasparek character. Kasparek is extremely important in the Czech Republic because as, uh, after the Austrians crushed them in 1620, they were not allowed to use Czech for any important public events, for theater, for anything. They did let them use them for puppets. So Czech was useful in, like in, for the field hands and for the puppeteers. And it kind of helped keep the language alive. Later, when the language laws relaxed at the end of the 1800s, they, uh, oh, uh, Kasparek was saying all sorts of things about the Austrians. There was even a statue for him. This is another version of Kasparek. There's even a, a statue, and this is another version of Kasparek. You can see he kind of looks like Punch. Um, but he's more like the guy, he's the fool who says the truth. And uh, so he, he takes a particularly heroic role in the Czech Republic. I don't know who this is. This is just like one of the most ugliest looking ones of these I've ever seen. I just ha I saw this recently in Paris and had to uh, record it. This is Petrushka, the Russian version. And uh, this is just a gesture that a friend of mine who's Czech made. But you can see that there's a family resemblance between the gesture and all of these figures. And this is uh, a Harlequin puppet, uh, who's usually dressed with these more patchwork designs. And now we come to another extremely old style of puppetry in Europe, which may actually be older than uh, the uh, what we just saw with Punch. And this is Sicilian marionettes. And if you go down to... I, I really got to get myself to Palermo. And Palermo... You have these Sicilian marionettes. They're big. They're about this tall. Oh, wow. And they're heavy. They have a rod in them. So the people play them on the side. And they move around. They bash swords together. Now, here's the interesting thing about them that's probably different than anywhere else in the world. One of these stories will be in 300 parts. These were designed to come back every week and see a new chapter. And it's just fantastic that that would happen. I would love to go, you know, I would love to go spend a year there and just see how many version, how many parts of the story I would see. So, um, so this is we're now in the world of marionettes. In English, marionettes always mean string puppets. Although these Sicilian marionettes were primitive in that they also had a rod in their head and not just strings. But uh, in France, the word marionette means all puppets. So sometimes that's confusing. This is perhaps the oldest theater in Europe. It's in Belgium, uh, in Brussels, called the Tone Marionette Theater. And I saw recently the Three Musketeers, the Trois Musketeers. And uh, it, the, they, I saw also a version of their Romeo and Juliet, which was extremely funny. And in the middle of it, a cell phone goes off, and it's one of the puppets. And he says, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I, I meant to turn it off. <laughs> it says, oh, by the way, you should too. But uh, 
So they, they really play with it. This is inside the, uh, this is not, uh, this is some of these really old puppets that they have. Now, uh, Nicolas Jael there says that their style is totally based on the uh, Sicilian marionettes. They have the rods and the heads and such. But they said you really should go to Liège because they have a, a completely different style there. But you can see these old puppets have just been battered and, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, these are inside their, their uh, cafe slash museum at the, that theater. This is from the th performance I just saw. I loved this horse. It was made out of like carpet fabric, <laughs> you know, which I thought was a brilliant idea. And this was like a, a, a decapitated head from one of the musketeers. Well, not the musketeers, but the uh, soldiers they were fighting. Which then brings us to, uh, this is a version of Don Giovanni that is a, uh, done in the Czech Republic. If you ever go there, the National Marionette Theater does uh, a Don Giovanni. It's pretty good. However, warning, there are fake Don Giovannis there. Not nearly so good. Some done by Serbians, who I'm sure mean well, but uh, I think they're just trying to make money. But this is the real thing. Again, they have uh, rods in their heads. But this is interesting because some of the most important marionette pieces are Don Giovanni or Don Juan, uh, Faust. Alice in Wonderland gets done quite a bit. Uh, obviously, the Three Musketeers. Almost any classic European story gets told as a puppet story. Uh, this is actually an opera played to a recording of music. So you see the, the characters singing and such like that. This is a, a, a more classic marionette theater um, where you can see these little figures walking around. From I actually saw this show. This was the Nutcracker being done in the Salzburg Marionette Theater. And uh, the Salzburg Marionettes, which I highly recommend, it's expensive, probably about 35 euros to go see it. And it's done in this amazing old, uh, like, Rococo little theater. Uh, and... This, these are some of the puppets. This is a Mozart, and this is, like I guess, supposed to be his wife. But if you start counting strings here, there are nine, which is quite a bit. To, to work these puppets, you have to... It's like learning to play the piano. They're that complicated. I have a puppet at home that I had made for me in the Czech Republic with nine strings, and that's a lot to work. You, two hands, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. you got to use two hands. So you use one, and then there's a separate rocker arm and it's quite complicated some of them make them bow make them walk and make their arms move make their heads go around so and that is some of the most complicated puppetry there is also of course uh besides the themes of of uh, the classic european tales i think faust and don giovanni are the are the most classic for puppet theaters uh you also have many stories featuring animals so you know here you have a wolf there's some sort of weird bird. Um, and here are classic uh, more figures. These are from the Gdania Museum in Lyon. And so essentially you could do any sort of figure with puppetry. They would actually come around, uh, say, 300 years ago and do complete versions in the Czech Republic of Macbeth as a puppet show or Hamlet. You know, And that's one way they kept the language alive was by doing, they would do reduced versions essentially, but still, they would do these long puppet shows. Uh, that's interesting because it's an older puppet, but it shows no caricature. It's not a caricature of a black person. The, if you went to the same period in America, you would see what we call the blackface coon image on the puppet. But here, uh, that's, a, that's a really nice depiction of a black, uh, maybe a moor in a show or something like this. Or, this is really nice, just the 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 uh, this was in the uh, Gdania Museum like the last one was as well just the expression on that face it's just this kind of like forlorn uh, you know child like image maybe uh, the other one was Shakespeare as well was it could have been Othello yes Othello. yes you, you're very correct um, so uh, and then of course devils are just like meant for I mean the, the devils go all the way back to the Middle Ages. Uh, and so there's lots of devil imagery. This one's nice. It's made out of yarn, which is uh, that's the interesting thing is you start realizing after a while. I have no idea what that is. I just put it in there. We're now starting to get to, into the realm of what I'd call modern puppetry, and modern puppetry takes the older style and then begins to work it. And the big period for that is the late 
1800s and the first half of the 20th century. And there's a lot of things that happen. But check this out. And that just is like, this is from the Gdania Museum, as is the next one. It is just so complex, a puppet wearing a mask. Or even this one. A puppet wearing a puppet wearing a puppet. I mean, it's just, uh, I, that just completely fries my brain, because that's for one person to perform. <laughs> but, it looks like politics to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and these are more modern puppets from the uh, first half of the 20th century. You'll, see, you'll notice that the molding and the, uh, the characters feel more complex and different. Um, mermaids. This is also from the uh, Théâtre du Perruche in Brussels. This is by Paul Clay. Paul Clay was very fascinated with puppetry and would make puppets out of all sorts of materials. So here he's made them out of fur. And this is, uh, I mentioned Richard Teschner before. Uh, this is in, in, in the Austrian Theater Museum in Vienna. You can go see these things. They're fascinating. I might have a picture or two uh, from when I visited there last time. But he always did them in these circles. And he did things like nativities, but he also brought back the the rod puppets, where you move them from underneath with rods, which was the Wayang Golak. So he consciously brought them back from Indonesia. And uh, these are some of the puppets I found sitting in, uh, probably the Arabian Nights, sitting in uh, the Austrian Museum. That's another one. I don't know what story that was telling. These are more Teschner puppets. His are probably some of the most beautiful puppets there are, just as far as craftsmanship goes. He was evidently independently wealthy. And so he just got, he just devoted his time to making puppets and doing shows for people. And, and evidently now there is a man who has studied the what footage we do have of his style of film and has recreated, for instance, around uh, Christmas time, they re, he's recreated his nativity play. And I'd really like to see that Vienna someday. Now, this is weird. Evidently, you can have birds flying around in the middle of your puppet. <laughs> and here's the thing, is as we get into the modern world, the definitions are going to start changing of what you can do. So, But this is uh, in the 1800s. Now, that's just one person. <laughs> ah, now we come to the another form of puppetry that a lot of people know and fear, uh, the ventriloquist. And ventriloquist is from an old Roman word, evidently, meaning speaking from the belly. And so you're supposed, you know, and we're actually going to see a, a little footage of a ventriloquist or two coming up here. This is actually an automated, an automaton monkey. The automaton, the basic difference between the automaton and the puppet is you wind up the automaton and it does things by itself. The automaton leads to things like the computer and the robot. The automaton can also be used as a puppet. That is to say, if you turn it around and make it a right apart for what it does in your play, you now have a puppet. So, Schrankmeyer uses them in his plays. This is the most famous automaton of, uh, of all, called the Chess Playing Turk, but in fact it's not an automaton. It is a puppet. And uh, this puppet uh, there was a vogue for uh, very complex automatons at the end of the 17th, uh, 18th century, in the end of the 1700s. And um, uh, we're going to see one of these old puppets, uh, I think the Marie Antoinette puppet, playing actual an instrument. But the interesting thing about this is this chess player won. And no one could figure out how it was done, because when you started the show, you opened it up, you made sure everyone saw everything, but the secret was actually hidden inside there. There was a very small man who had mirrors. I, I don't know exactly where the mirrors were attached, maybe to the eyes somehow, but could see what was happening and could respond. He was actually a good chess player. And he actually beat Ben Franklin and Napoleon. And Napoleon got so mad that he swiped it. And everyone thought they were playing an automaton. Mm -hmm. But they were playing a puppet. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. 
Um, and this is another uh, illusion of an automaton as well. This guy goes under the name of Psycho. And uh, this is a magician, Richard Maskelin from England. And uh, they would, uh, he would play in a place called Egyptian Hall. Uh, they would uh, present these as automata, uh, automata is the official word. And, uh, and, and yet, in fact, it was a sleight of hand puppet show. Whereas he would say, oh, did you choose this card? Pick it up. And of course, it would be the card that he chose. So um, at this point, we're going to take a little bit of a break from the slideshow. And then we're going to watch some actual uh, pretty short clips uh, from some different puppet shows. Because in fact, none of this matters until you see the movement. So the first one we're going to watch is, this is a little bit of uh, the tone Romeo and Juliet. Uh, and we'll give that a look. Donc ça fait toi et toi et donc c'est Monsieur Snell. Ah, ah. Euh, Snell vous-même, espèce de lobecac. Ah, vous me traitez de lobecac. Irrité. Trois X intestinales, on part trois fois troubler le calme de nos rues. Trois fois, j'ai dû intervenir. Trois fois, j'ai dû me déranger. Mais il m'a fait, et il en jouait ce qu'on Oui, oui, oui. Bien des matins, on l'a vu là-bas. Augmentant de ses larmes la fraîche rose et de l'aube. Oh, il pleure, et il... Ah oui, oui. Ça pique. Ah. Ah. Mes yeux, regardez pour la dernière fois. Mes bras, une dernière étreinte. Et vous, mes lèvres, faites que ce baiser légitime soit une alliance éternelle avec Juliette. Je meurs ainsi, sur un baiser. Oh, quel bonheur Je m'éveille sur un baiser. Comme la belle au bois dormant. Mm -hmm. Roméo, mon amour, tu es là. Mais, qu'est-ce que je vois Quel est ce vilain poignard planté dans, de, dans ton décan d'herbe So in the end, they both come to life because this is a comedy version of Romeo and Juliet. Um, but uh, actually, this guy, Nicolas Géal, right there, his troupe moves them. And again, these are the size of the, uh, the Sicilian marionettes. They're quite large. But he does all the voices, which is really funny. And I, I, I've got a little bit of footage of him doing those voices. You can see him like mashing his mouth into all these different kind of characters and stuff like that. <coughs> So next one, I'll uh, show you a little bit of the Salzburg marionettes. And they play two recordings of operas. Here gibt es zwar kein Orchester, Musik und Stimmen kommen vom Band, aber sonst ist alles da für eine veritable Opernbühne. I do have an English version of this, but unfortunately not this one. <laughs> Notice how far the, uh, the strings go there. And I can tell you watching this, if you're sitting far enough back, it looks like little people on the stage. Mm. 
Dann hat er noch an den Schultern Fäden, dass er den Kopf gut neigen kann. Und hat noch rückwärts einen Faden, dass er sich ganz tief neigen kann. This woman, Gretel Eicher, is the third generation of the uh, puppeteers running this uh, particular uh, marionette theater. She passed away a few years back, and the new director has now started doing more. Well, the, one thing they've done is they've added a few more, uh, shall we say, call them commercial items. So they do a version of The Sound of Music now. But they're also doing things that are a little more edgy as well. Not, not edgy, but more experimental for them. Uh, but certainly not more experimental for me. Here is uh, one of the most important automatons, the Jouez de Timpano, which is uh, based on Marie Antoinette. And the interesting thing about this this uh, automaton is she is actually playing the instrument. This isn't like the music coming from somewhere else. And they've kind of opened it up a little so you can see the uh, pieces of her moving. This is called a barrel and pin, and these are the little cans on the side. There are more complicated, much more complicated ones than this in uh, Lausanne, or not Lausanne, Neuchâtel. I'm hoping to see them this Sunday. Uh, Joe and I were thinking of going out there, so. I see your, I see your link to, to yeah, computers, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and the ones in, the ones in uh, Neuchâtel are far more advanced than this. And they, for instance, there's one that writes different words, and there's one that draws different pictures, and one that plays music, different songs. And so they have these little things, you pull them out and put it in, and it looks like, you know, uh, the old uh, computer punch cards, you know, the, the programs they're running on. Uh, how so, big would that have been? That, uh, huh? How big would she have been? Uh, pro probably about this tall, I'm wow. guessing. But I have never seen that one, so I could be wrong. Okay, now we're going to look at a couple of ventriloquists. This will be the uh, the funny part of the evening. Arthur Worsley, this guy, English guy from uh, the 1950s and 60s. Uh, that's the his heyday. He, he he probably lived to the mid 80s. This guy is the best ventriloquist I have ever seen. Now, if you know anything about ventriloquism, you know you're not supposed to move your mouth, and you're supposed to throw your voice. And, you, and the part of the problem is, if you've ever tried to do this, you know that the hardest things to do are to say letters like M, which involve moving the lips, and especially B. Yeah. So, what we're about to watch is him saying things like, bottle of beer. Mm -hmm. And you don't see his lips moving whatsoever. It's absolutely amazing. And in fact, one of the key ingredients about his puppetry is... Um, he never speaks. The puppet does all the speaking, which is hysterical. So, this was from the Ed Sullivan show in the early sixties. The greatest ventriloquist we've ever had on our show comes from England, brings back here whenever I can get him, which is about once a year. His name is Arthur Worsley. So let's have a big hand. Well, get walking now. <laughs> all you've got to do, son, now is stand there. I've got all the work to do, ladies and gentlemen, all the work. And believe me, believe me, it's not just a matter of talking, as you might think. That's not one quarter of it. You'd be surprised if you knew what goes on. 
behind me. Turn me round, son. Jeez. If you new ladies and gentlemen the strings and strings and gadgets, turn me round, son. If you knew what I got to go through just to try and entertain you, you'd be surprised and shocked. And tonight, turn me round, sir. Tonight, I turn me round, sir. Tonight, I intend showing you exactly what I need. Do it, sir. Uh, Charlie's talking to you. I knew this lad when he was alive, a lovely boy. <laughs> Have a look at that. You've not seen this before on television, unless you crawl around the back of the set. Have a look! Well, how do you like that, eh? How would you like to go through life like that? No guts from somebody else's hand where your kidneys ought to be. <laughs> Say a bottle of beer. I'm moving you now. Go on. Say a bottle of beer without moving your mouth. Say it while I'm close up to you. Go on. Say a bottle of beer, a bottle of beer, a bottle of beer, a bottle of beer, a bottle of beer. <laughs> No, that's just like you never you see anything like that. <laughs> it never has been done, ladies and gentlemen. It's impossible, but I can do it. Watch me, a bottle of beer. <laughs> <laughs> Someone I'm hoping eventually in my documentary to interview is a more contemporary one named Nina Conti. And uh, I think she is probably the best ventriloquist I have seen in the modern setting. And uh, the thing about her is she's also totally postmodern. She does things where she becomes her, her puppet. It's very strange. But this one is called uh, basically turning a human into a puppet. So... <laughs> Yeah, but it, it's like suddenly the more you start seeing them, you're like, whoa, there's a lot of aspects to puppetry that, you know, you didn't see it all as one thing, yeah. but it is. And uh, that's like, uh, some people think uh, ventriloquists are the weirdest puppeteers uh, alive. Although this guy, this Russian puppeteer, which we're going to move into a little section here looking at puppetry behind the Iron Curtain and such. Uh, but check this out. Yeah, Russia is responsible for a, a lot of developments in the uh, second half of the 20th century, uh, that, particularly things that happened uh, in the Iron Curtain countries. Um, 
what was happening in America? Well, America was essentially doing what Europe was doing. They had Punch. They had <laughs> some of the other characters. Uh, the long shows kind of by the end of the 1800s disappeared. So they weren't doing them. And they were becoming little acts in circus troops or in uh, music hall, vaudeville stage. Um, and so people... Uh, uh, but around the turn of the century, there was a guy. This is Tony Sarg is his name. And uh, I believe he was of Italian parentage. Uh, but he, for instance, this is called the Nantucket uh, Sea Monster. He built this puppet and put it on the beach in Nantucket. Now, this puppet was con uh, controlled by balloons. And everyone came out one morning and just found this thing on the beach. But the, these balloons eventually became the balloons of the Macy's Parade. And so he invented those. and Which is a radically different idea about puppets. It's like, you're holding the puppet down. It's floating away. <laughs> so this is what started happening in America. There was more of a, an emphasis on showmanship. Yeah, uh, This is uh, a Walrus and the Carpenter, uh, done during the uh, 1930s. Uh, well, yeah. And this was also Tony Sarg. This was his actual puppetry. By the way, did you know King Kong was a puppet, the original? Mm -hmm. He was a stop-motion animation puppet. And if you go back now, I and mean, we're so used to the digital imagery and stuff, but when you watch King Kong again, you realize you're watching the whole thing as a puppet show. It's all little creatures being moved around. You can see the hair on King Kong moving around and such. Um, and this is what King Kong looks like underneath. There are no King Kongs left that have their original hair on them. But this is what's called the armature underneath. And you need something strong and metallic. to, And you pose it very small movements to get the illusion of life. And the, the person who did this was a man named Willis O'Brien, who eventually helped teach his technique to Ray Harryhausen, who was the person who probably spread, those two spread the concept of stop motion animation throughout America at least, uh, more than anyone else. The first really famous American puppet was Charlie McCarthy, who was a ventriloquist puppet. He was in uh, many films, I have quite a few films by him, a lot of short films, a few longer films, he had a famous rivalry with the comedian W.C. Fields. Mm -hmm. But he's also the first one, and probably the first one anywhere in the world, that a lot of products were made based on this puppet. So there is so essentially there you could buy your own Charlie McCarthy puppet, uh, you know, a reduced version. The big change came in America with the introduction of television. This is Howdy Doody, who was very famous of our children's shows, um, along with that clown. Why why are people so afraid of clowns now? Anyway, uh, sorry, that's another story. But uh, what's interesting is. Because of television, and, and because of early television had a lot of problems with what would be called video feedback, when your lines were too close together in certain kinds of imagery, they wanted puppets that were uh, s stripped down and simple. So this is Kukla, Fran, and Ollie, and uh, the puppeteer uh, Burr Tilstrom. Uh, Fran being the woman, and Kukla. Kukla is actually the Russian name for puppet. Um, and uh, these were interesting shows done exclusively for children, which leads us to uh, this guy, whose name is uh, Bill Baird, did a very interesting book on puppetry in about 1964. Uh, I got a lot of my information originally on Czech puppetry from that book. But uh, he, would, he did, you, one thing you'll start to notice is they're starting to get these like really cute f features on the faces. And uh, there's actually one up on top there that's like a stripper puppet, which is really bizarre because it's also cute. Um, I don't think that one was done on television. But well, also Bill Baird is the guy who did the puppets in The Sound of Music. So if those puppets you think are Austrian, oh. they were American versions. And Austrian puppets don't look like that. But then again, we come to Jim Henson, and Jim, this, uh, uh, the Muppets became so huge that, uh, to this day, Americans, as soon as you say puppets, they immediately start thinking of these creatures. And essentially, it's such a small, narrow slice of what a puppet is. 
Um, yet, when Americans decide they want to do something that's edgy, oh hi, sorry, uh, they do. So, or this is Peter Jackson from New Zealand, but it's essentially Muppets. It's just like, you know, seedy, shady, uh, loose Muppets. Uh, this is Avenue Q in New York. You know, it's got all sorts of risque themes in it, but Muppets, essentially. Uh, Americans kind of are stuck on Muppets, which is one of the reasons why I'm not going through America studying puppetry. I would be running into far too much of this stuff, and it just doesn't interest me as, as images. Although one interesting thing, there was a guy named Peter Schumann who came from Germany to America and started what's called the Bread and Puppets Theater. And there were these large puppets that were used in protest marches. He started in the late 60s. He's in his 80s now. And um, they started Bread and Puppets, which then became kind of a commune for puppetry up in Vermont. Vermont has other puppet theaters, too. It's one of the places, along with North Carolina, uh, that are kind of have more puppetry than most American areas do. Um, but at the same time, I've never been quite fascinated with these in the same way as I am the European puppets because they're almost too big for me. Uh, they're good for protests, uh, but uh, as puppetry, uh, it gets to be a little bit too much spectacle. This is Russian, though. This is Sergei Obratsov, who uh, was one of the people who... Br uh, he changed a lot of puppetry everywhere. He was he was known for just putting two balls on his hand and making puppets out of that, or just with his fingers. Very s simple style. I mean, this is like a crying puppet. This was actually, I took this picture. There are very few Abratsov puppets in the West. This is in the Brussels Museum of uh, the uh, Paris Theater. But the interesting thing is, this is Poland now. Uh, what happened was the Russians took over Eastern Europe. And then they came along and they told everybody, you must have culture. And so they said, and this is what culture is. You must have opera, you must have ballet, you must have theater, and you must have puppets. And they saw the puppets for the kids, but they also saw them for adults as well. I, when I first went to Poland, I was looking for a puppet theater, and I couldn't find it. I mean, I, was, well, I had the address, I was looking around. Because when you say the name Puppet Theater, what kind of building comes to your mind? Not particularly big. These were like... I, when I found it, I, I, I walked by it because it was huge. It looked like some massive bank or city hall building. And that's what the Russians did. Is they, I mean, in fact, there's a puppet theater. This is from Krakow. This is kind of in the back storage area of the uh, Teatro Grotesca. And uh, you find these strange puppets back there, you know. Uh, the Poles and, and the Czechs are not afraid of any kind of imagery when it comes to puppets. These, these, are, these were made in the uh, 2005 when I was visiting. I saw this show, and it's called Balladina. These puppets are amazingly made out of this burlap material. I mean, these are real works of art. There's another one here. Um, and people would play with these on the end of their hands. And so these would be like these almost like ghostly figures within this play. It was really fascinating. And this was also at uh, Teatro Grotesca. They would get away with all sorts of uh, interesting messages in their plays that were read as allegories. So that uh, they would submit a copy of the script to the censor. <coughs> and then the censor would go, okay. And they'd stamp it and hand it back. And then they would change the imagery to make it do what they wanted to do, to say what they wanted to say with it. And then hope that there is no secret agent in the public. Yeah, well, in the in the communist age, uh, what I'm told is that the the, the communist censors, they, uh, these weren't like people who knew anything about art. They were just uh, they were so dull headed that they couldn't see it. Now the Nazis, how on the other on the other hand did see these things in the Czech Republic, and they ended up killing over a hundred puppeteers. We'll talk about the Czech Republic in a moment. But this is from Georgia, where I'm going, and this is called the Battle of Stalingrad. And this this is like their most famous puppet play. It's still going at the Gabriadze Theater. The Battle of Stalingrad. If you know anything about World War II history, you know that's the big battle. That's like this horrible, bloody battle. Essentially, the Germans were turned around by the Russians there, but Stalin made sure millions of people died before that happened. And this is a puppet show based on that. 
you know. And one of the things I saw over time, particularly as I went through Eastern Europe, is that you could say anything you wanted with puppetry. You might not be able to get the psychological realism of an actor on certain levels, but you could communicate any way you wanted. I mean, as soon as you start talking about puppets wanting to separate themselves from their puppeteer, jeepers. That sounds pretty much like something I would deal with uh, on an almost theological level, you know. So, uh, there's a lot, in fact, when I was talking with uh, Henrik Yurkowski, the puppet historian, I interviewed him, I said, well, how do you see puppets? And he, what, what is a puppet? And he said, a puppet is something which is dead that you breathe life into. And I said, kind of like taking the dust of the earth and creating human beings. And it was like, yeah. So very interesting analogies. So, we come to the Czech Republic, which, uh, for my money, is the place for puppetry in Europe. And their history, uh, this magazine, Lotkash, uh, Lotkash, is the been in existence over a hundred years. Uh, they've probably, they're not the only ones to take puppetry seriously. They certainly do in France and other countries. But uh, they've certainly, the, the Czech history of puppetry goes back uh, back about 400 years, the, the serious puppetry. But what they've done is their puppetry has been used more. I mentioned Kasparik uh, saying anti-Austro-Hungarian messages. During the Nazi era, uh, they had puppets because, you know, what German knows Czech? Czech is one of the hardest languages, certainly the hardest Slavic language. And the Germans, of course, didn't know. But they started eventually getting the idea Oh my goodness, we've we've censored them everywhere else, but we didn't think about the puppet theaters, because who thinks about puppet theaters? And suddenly, all these messages were coming through. Through uh, the, In fact, uh, over 100 puppeteers died at the hands of the Nazis from the Czech Republic. Uh, in fact, there were Jewish uh, uh, Czechs who were thrown into the Terezin concentration camp who were making puppets out of rags. Not only that, Two puppets, Spavel and Hervinek, who are Hervinek, who are the very important puppets in in uh, uh, the Czech, but also the the uh, the Germans knew these puppets very well. There are German versions of these uh, the, of these characters, and they arrested the SS actually arrested the puppets, <laughs> and not just the puppeteer. The puppeteer Josef Skupa escaped with his life when he was in Dresden in prison. They bombed the prison, and he got out. No, you know, the rest of the town disintegrated, but somehow he got out. And again, the, uh, during the, the, the communist era, they used puppetry for these uh, uh, allegories that they would tell. So this is a, a skeleton, very much shows up often in Czech puppetry, and it never means death, simply. It means, how are you living? When they see a skeleton, it always has that resonance of see how you're living, because you will one day die. But how are you living now? Um, and again, uh, this is from a Faust play, Devils. This is Faust, a classic, uh, one of the classic Czech puppets. Don Giovanni, as I mentioned before, a good show to see if you're there. That's a very beautiful puppet. And you can see the, the work taken to make the clothing on this. Uh, and these were puppets I found in the, uh, the, the National Museum in the town of Hudim. Uh, a lot of different figures. This was from a play. This character represented the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And they had a, like a live person dancing with this. Uh, then they had these devils taunting the person who had the Moravian bagpipe, which was uh, represented in a sense the Czech soul. And they kept trying to tempt this bagpipe away. And so it was the Austro-Hungarian Empire, eventually the communists. And eventually all this money appears and, and this big skyscraper building. And that is, of course, the modern world. And, um, but one of my favorite groups, direct descendants of Jan Schwenkmeier's style, is this group Bukti Alotki, which means cakes and puppets. And uh, the reason I love this is because it looked like they just made this stuff with material they found in their backyard and in mm. their, their attics. And I said to myself, we can do this in Alaska, this kind of thing. And so I took this back, and this was the basis of our style. But you'll notice that actually this stage had three layers on it. 
and sometimes three things would be going on at once. A little puppet walks out, he drinks in a bottle, falls asleep, and then the next part is his dream. And he's sleeping the whole time. You see him moving every now and then. You know, and then this is the close up. And I asked them why, why the close up, and they says, "Well, it's like cinema; they were editing the so that something bigger would happen." Now, this is actually them setting it up earlier. I didn't take photos during this particular uh, shoot. Uh, this is up in the Bukti Alotki uh, studio. Just various characters. The Czechs have a very black sense of humor. And then we come to puppet films, and this we're near the end here. Puppet films are really important. Uh, they start with this Polish guy who was in Moscow named Ladislaw Starowicz. And uh, this is his roman of Reynard, uh, essentially the, story, the tale of uh, Reynard the Fox. And uh, I saw this. These are from, I was just at a museum show that had a few of his puppets. He started by animating actual beetle carcasses because he was an entomologist and a director of a nat natural history museum. And so he got the idea that he couldn't make them fight each other. They kept dying. So he finally took the carcasses and animated them. But he did things like this fantastic sequence out of this movie called Mascot of the Devil's Ball, which was later, in great parts of that were incorporated into the uh, Night on Bald Mountain sequence in Fantasia. And so he started in about 1908 doing these. Uh, this is from the 1930s, and this is from the uh, Reynard the Fox. Uh, but these were the actual puppets. I'd never seen them in color before. Just these incredible. And he would make them out of hair and out of bone and, and also various bits of rubber. And he would manipulate the mouths. I have no idea what that is. That's just like the kind of crazy stuff he came up with. And he was very influential to other people, like Jan Schwenkmeyer. So this is uh, Schwenkmeyer. Uh, from his movie called Little Otik, which is about these people who want a baby. What they do is they, they get one made out of a stump of branches, and it starts eating everything and takes over their world. This is from another movie of his. Uh, I'm pretty sure those are real false teeth and false eyes. This is another kind of an art puppet of his. And related to them, also influenced very much by Ladislaw Starovich is the Brothers Quay, whom I had the pleasure of spending a couple of days with this year. They, they've had shows at the Museum of Modern Art in New York of their sets. Um, they, are not, they are actually Americans who live in London, but they're completely involved in European puppetry, uh, puppet films. This is another Czech named uh, Jirši Barta, who does it. This is an amazing piece about mannequins that come to life. So now we're kind of coming in at the end here. Uh, this is just more recent puppetry in the 21st century. And all of this is European. That's actually a real skeleton, but it's also a real puppet. I found this in a Czech museum of sorts. A friend of mine carving puppets. And the, the amazing thing is the grammar of puppetry has so expanded. The kinds of materials that you can now use. It used to be very specific kinds of things, but now it's almost any, any texture, any object that you can imagine can be turned into a puppet of some sort. This is what the kind of work she does. She's Czech. This is, I found this in uh, Lyon, Arabic, a poster for Arabic puppetry in uh, Paris, or is it Lyon? I think this is Lyon, actually. And But I keep getting people joining on to my Facebook page for Gravity from Above, my documentary project. It's amazing how many have Arabic names, and and you look on their page, and it's like puppetry. It's, it's amazing, because puppetry is kind of like forbidden, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So this is actually from one of our shows in Alaska. She made this uh, ballerina. These are shows from uh, Paris, France. A man named uh, Francois Lazaro, who... This is actually a piece of Beckett. Uh, the, uh, the playwright Beckett. Samuel Beckett. Uh, this is from the, uh, one of the performances at the, uh, uh, the International Puppetry Institute. They have a school there for puppeteers to learn. Uh, this is another piece from that. Uh, and I, when I saw these shows in 2005, I was just impressed by how much you could say with puppetry. And in fact, that girl, uh, Aurelia Yvonne, went on later to create this. And this is, and she's 
she, this is her Android. And she specifically made, she had this constructed, it took years to make, but to make this point about the dehumanization of humanity. And this is another version of it. And in fact, that is her face on, the, on it that she had made. Very interesting. And this is the stuff that comes out of Nantes in France. They do this, they actually, I'm, we're going to look at a, a bit of this from Liverpool in just a second. These giant puppets by the name of the troupe is Royale Deluxe. And uh, that should be the end of the slideshow. And I think we've just got, yeah, two quick things here. And uh, we'll look at, I want to show you a little bit of the Brothers Quay. This is a about a two a minute and a half introduction to their work by Christopher Nolan, who made a short little film. He he really is fascinated and influenced by their work. I've shown people their work, and then afterwards I tell them, I will expect a doctoral thesis in about three years on this, because <laughs> it's that complex. And one more piece, I'll show you a little, we'll end with this. This is a Royal Deluxe. They did a, uh, a show in Liverpool a couple years back, and uh, they have these giant puppets. This is La Petite Chante, the little girl giant, and her dog Chola. They're asleep now. But soon they're going to wake up in the Chanter City. It's amazing, absolutely. It's just a delight to be here to even see it, you know what I mean? It's <laughs> not very loud, like, but it's good. <laughs> Breakfast. You can't make this event up too much because it is going to be so all inspiring to see this. It's absolutely boss. It was just amazing the way they, they made it and the like the detail of it is just amazing. You can't realise the the the, uh, the size of it until somebody's in front of it and then you get the perspective. has become La Petite Géante, the little girl giant, in her home city, with an uncle who needs to find her. Uncle has now emerged from the water at the Albert Dock. He's Now the unexpected is happening. May's uncle has a special delivery. He's been diving on the wreck of the Titanic and has a letter from her father. Anyway, so, 
I never knew that me people made puppets that lock. I also had never heard of it. Exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, for me, it's it's an exploration into a world of art that uh, has really surprised me. And, and I do see it as a, a, just a m means of artistic expression that's wide open. And that is to say, uh, it, you know, many arts have reached a kind of a pinnacle. You know, like if you want to be in a, uh, a band or something, it's really hard to do anything original. I mean, someone like me can come along and pick out your influences really quickly. But if you do this, it's amazing. I, like I said, I took a trip through America for two year, uh, two months, and people were just walking up to me afterwards saying, I, I didn't know you could do this. And, and uh, you know, like one, actually one girl came up in, in North Carolina and said, that really disturbed me. And I said, really? Why? And she goes like, well, I could tell you were trying to get us to think, but you weren't telling us how. You know, I wasn't feeding the stuff. The whole point of that show, among other things, was to get people to really think about things and just start using their brain, which I, I realized I could do with puppetry. But the other thing, I had like uh, someone in Oregon came up and said, I'm going to ho go home tonight and start making puppets. And someone else came up and says, gosh, it's so amazing that he's something that isn't like digital. You know, and I think we have a longing for something you can touch. And uh, when I'd see Guignol shows and the children in France just howl when things happen, they they want to. And 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 I've seen one show where the wrong thing happened. That is, a character died that they didn't want to die, and they all were like, "No!" You know. But it was amazing. And then later, the character came back. But it was almost like they were learning to critique art. It was like, no, this feels wrong, you know. But they were right. It, it, it did feel wrong. And, uh, but yeah, it just it seems to have a lot of uh, potential. So that I've found, heck, in order to do something original, I have to use anything <laughs> because it's just so wide open. It's been uh, folk art for a long time, and it's it, you know it's had these commercial applications. But those are such narrow slices. Now, uh, you know, I was, I was thinking, like, how would I represent God? I was just like, well, the obvious way would be light, but it would be even more interesting if you just didn't show anything. You know, and just darkness, start off with darkness, you know, and, and do that. Um, and, and so it just strikes me as just a lot of possibilities. I think you can speak, one of the nice things is I can speak directly through this means. In other ways, you have to be so indirect. You know, because you, you, everything's been said. You know, if you're writing songs, you're painting, whatever. It's just you've got so much history in front of you. Whereas this, it has a lot of history. And the wonderful thing about puppet history is how obscure it is. Mm -hmm. You know, there are characters like Captain Pod. And, you know, <laughs> that's like the first puppeteer whose name we know from England. Uh, these these strange kinds of histories and, and such. And, and wherever puppetry is, there's all this interesting paraphernalia that goes with it. So. People without, without history is not redeemed from, from time. For history is a pattern of timeless moments.